So um, the cultivation of political emotions, um, just let's look at some central concepts that are here. By all means, take notes if you want to, but I'll make this available, this PowerPoint, subsequently as well. Um, so one of the starting points for thinking about this is the book that Martha Nussbaum wrote in 2013. I appreciate that some of you won't know who Martha Nussbaum is, but she's, I think she's about 68 now. She's a, a very uh, well-respected um, uh, American philosopher who's written about a wide range of things. She made her name by writing about Greek philosophy in 1983 in an excellent book called The Fragility of Goodness, The Delicacy of Goodness, um, The Vulnerability of Goodness. And she's written a lot about literature, but subsequently, perhaps through her fame, she became um, very much uh, wanted as a speaker in different contexts. So she's worked in law departments, she's written about education, she's written about human rights, many, many different topics, um, maybe too many in my view. Um, so her most recent book is Political Emotions, and she writes in a fairly accessible style, as you've seen from the text you've, that's been distributed. And in that book, she argues that the political emotions must be reclaimed as the crucial condition for realizing a just society on a global scale. Substance cannot be given to our abstract ideals without looking at those particular circumstances of vulnerability and dependence revealed to us through the expression of emotions. Now, when she talks about abstract ideas or abstract ideals of justice, the reference point for that is probably quite specific because in 1972, an American philosopher called John Rawls, I'll spell that for you because it sounds like rules, but it's R-A-W-L-S. Do you all know him or not? Yeah. So his book, A Theory of Justice, from that time, is a real landmark in at least Anglophone political philosophy. It's a landmark in the sense that most philosophers working in the analytical tradition would place their work somehow or other in relation to what Rawls did. And like many philosophers, Rawls tried to start from a, a blank piece of paper. We've got a blank starting point. How do we construct a just society? So he works out what those basic conditions would be in a very rigorously argued and powerful and important book. But it starts off with a blank canvas, just thinking of human beings, how should they fit together? And it's theoretical. You know, it looks, of course, it acknowledges that people have feelings like anger and so on. But the, the main focus is on what the proper or right or justifiable rules to, ju to govern a society should be. Do you understand that? It's on rules or principles. It's not on the felt reality of human lives. So what Nussbaum is saying, as others have done as well, is that if we're going to have a just society, we must take that felt reality, the emotions that people experience, fully into account. Am I speaking too fast for anybody? Okay, and she stresses vulnerability and dependence, which will come back in various forms. And vulnerability can arise as a result of human hardship, but in fact it's part of the human condition anyway, isn't it? We all are ill at some times. We all were babies, and if we're lucky, we will be old and probably start to get weaker and more frail as we get older. So others who've written in this vein, um, the very eminent philosopher Michael Sandel um, developed a critique of John Rawls. It's a sympathetic critique, critique um, but he thinks that there are ways in which the abstractness of Rawls' account doesn't acknowledge sufficiently the ways in which human beings are embedded in particular social contexts, particular sets of relationships, that these are various, these relationships, different in different cultures, and that conditions and shapes the meaningfulness of human lives. Now, Michael Sandel actually wrote a book called Justice, I think about eight years ago, which was translated into Japanese, 
and I understand it became an extraordinary bestseller. So in the ordinary local high street bookshops in Japan, you would see piles of this book. And Naoko told me, I can't really believe this, but she told me that within a year, I believe most things she says, but I, can't, I don't know if I believe this. She told me that within a year of publication, it had been translated, or sorry, reprinted 60 times. So absolutely extraordinary sales. You can't imagine this in the West, I think. Right? And that's just, it's a very readable book, but it is a serious philosophy book about justice. So that's Michael Sandel. Iris Marion Young uh, made a very important contribution of a more feminist line to thinking about questions of justice, including write about, writing about education. And pragmatism, of course, I'm talking about a range of philosophers here, William James, Dewey, and so on, who've had important things to say. But the important things they say are like this. So Sandel has argued that combining sympathy with rational dialogue is necessary for global justice. So you can't achieve justice through, purely through rational deliberational, rational means. Okay, that's a partial resistance to John Rawls. And uh, also that, um, oh sorry, that's necessary for global justice. So the emphasis there is not on just sorting out justice within our own country, but attending to this as a global matter and manifestly, manifestly acknowledging the um, unjust in distribution of wealth in the world. So Iris Marion Young has shown the centrality of emotions in shaping and completing the work of public reason. Public reason would be reasoning about how we are to live together, what kind of institutions are to be set up, formal and informal, and that can't work without uh, acknowledging the centrality of the emotions. And pragmatist traditions, William James, Dewey, and so on, have consistently argued that if democracy is to be understood as a way of life, rather than as a form of government, the education of democratic emotions must take center stage. Now pause a little bit over this, some of you study Dewey, I know, but that phrase, democracy as a way of life, is very important here. If you ask the average voter what democracy is, they would say, well, every four or five years, we have elections and we vote people into the houses of parliament or into the government and so on. That's how they would see it working. That is democracy. But if that's all democracy is, it certainly won't achieve a just society. If we think of justice and democracy is closely connected, then we'll need much more than a voting system, a fair voting system, in order to achieve justice. And so in Jewish philosophy, this actually goes all the way through life, in a sense, that there's no point in which what we're doing is completely separate from our lives with other people, and everything we do has some bearing on creating a just and democratic world. Okay. And, uh, of course, Dewey, wrote, Dewey probably is most famous for his book, Democracy and Education. I think it's not his best book, but Democracy and Education has its centenary in 2016. And so you'll see quite a lot published about this. There's a conference going on in Cambridge about Democracy and Education that year and so on. Any questions so far? Yeah. What's the name of Stanley's book? Um, well, he wrote several, um, and the, the ones he, he, I'm not going to be able to answer this, um, in about 1984 he came out with a critique of um, Rawls, and that was a kind of landmark book, and the, the name's escaping me now, and I don't know what those are referring to. I can check up later on. Okay. Okay. He's writing very much in the same vein as John Rawls, so that's why I said it's a sympathetic critique. He's working in the same kinds of tradition. I'd say Iris, Iris Marin and Young is uh, a little bit more um, departing from that way of writing. Okay, so a politics adequate to our post-industrial risk society, to use the term from Ulrich Beck in 1986, must recast the practical philosophical question, how should I live, 
in terms of political emotions. So that reference to the practical philosophical question, this is a question that Re Plato raises in, in, in recounting what Socrates has said. How should I live? It's the most fundamental question for the human being. Okay? So I'm going to talk a little bit more, slightly more abstract terms now, more basic terms about what is meant by emotion. And it's interesting perhaps for you to translate the terms I'm using into Greek or Japanese or whatever your language is to see how they match up. Because sometimes, of course, one language makes distinctions which another doesn't, and sometimes it's the other way around. So what is an emotion? It's a word we probably know from when we're children, but it's rather more complex than perhaps it seems to be at first sight. So an emotion is an affective state, not effective, affective, of course. And what does affective mean? Well, it surely means it's to do with feeling. You are affected by something, you feel something in some way. And to say it's a state means it's something we experience and also that it's normally temporal or passing, right? So I felt a pain in my foot. I was angry with her yesterday. Okay, these are temporary states that we go through uh, rather than being ones that are permanently there. And episodic would mean it has uh, periods of time when it affects you. It may come back, it may not. Okay, it's not a permanent state normally. And of course, emotions relate to moods, but we think of moods a little bit more like background conditions, which may be a mix of thoughts about the world and physical conditions as well. All sorts of things can provide those background moods. If we say mood, it's usually something that endures for rather longer. Okay. So we've said there, um, what did I say there, affective states. But we can actually divide these affective states into two broad categories. On the one hand, we've got sensations, and on the other, we've got emotions. Now, in English, you can use the word feelings for both of those. So you've hurt my feelings, and I've hurt my foot. Can you see we use the word feeling uh, in both of those cases? But some of them, like having a pain in your foot, are just sensations, or toothache would be another example. But emotions are rather more complex than this, even though both may make you unhappy or happy, depending on the feeling or the sensation. So feelings can be predominantly physical and hence just sensations. So examples are itches, toothache, being tickled, or something tickling you. But feelings, as I said, that word can also refer to emotions, anger, sadness, and so on. Perhaps you're wondering why this is important, but I think I can show you in a minute. Because emotions are intentional states. Now, intentional is in inverted commas there because this is a technical philosophical usage. It doesn't mean something like this, that I intend to go Christmas shopping tomorrow. That's something I'm planning to do and I will go. It doesn't mean that kind of intention. What it means is that these states have an object outside oneself. If I have an itch or a toothache, it's just my body. That's all the reference point is. But they involve beliefs about the world. So, if I'm angry, I'm angry about something. If you're resentful, do you know that word, resentful, everybody? What's it in Japanese, please? Resentful. Okay. Okay. In Chinese? You understand? Yeah. Okay. Okay. In Hindi? <laughs> Don't you need that one? <laughs> if you're resentful, it's because you believe something has happened that is unfair, etc. Okay. Hence, it is wrong to see emotions as just a matter of feeling and separate from reason. So a toothache is separate from reason, it's just there affecting me, as it would do other animals as well, okay? But if you show me that what I believed happened did not, my anger should go away. 
Do you see that? So it's crucially related to what I believe about the world. If I believe as something's unjust and you can show me it's not, the same thing applies. And also, if I'm happy about something and it proves that the thing I'm happy about is not the case, then that happiness should go away as well. This is very important then because it helps to break down any assumed separation of emotion and reason. Okay, you can't have emotions unless there's a cognitive element to it, certain beliefs about the world. And in fact, much of our reasoning is empty without some sort of affective element. If only the good feeling that you think you're reasoning clearly, the sort of satisfaction that goes with that. So it's been a major mistake in philosophy and in other disciplines to think of these two things simply as separate. They're much more subtly intertwined. And on the whole, um, Indian and um, Japanese traditions of thought and Chinese traditions have not made these separations that are so typical of Western styles of reasoning. Okay. Another example of that would be, uh, I think you're all aware of the uh, tendency in the modern period in the Western world, that's to say since about 1600, to separate the mind from the body, as though they were simply two, two entities. In Indian thought, that kind of doesn't make sense, I think, does it? Um, similarly with, say, Buddhist forms of thought. Okay, any questions before I carry on? Right, so what is politics? And this is something we'll be circling around and coming back to later in the talk as well. So it is, of course, possible to compartmentalize politics, putting it in a box, in a clear chart. This is politics, this is ethics, perhaps this is morality as another box, I don't know. And people, especially in the West, like boxes to put things in. And sometimes, in particular contexts, it's helpful to make such distinctions. For example, if you say she knows what should be done, but she has to bear in mind the politics of the situation. Okay? She knows what should be done, but she has to bear in mind the politics of the situation. This could be a reference to the need to calculate how people are likely to respond. So suppose I know some course that needs to be put in place or some new change in the institute here and it has to go through various committees, then I'm clear about the moral purpose or the value of what I'm trying to do, but I probably have to check who's on the committee, know what their stance is, how they need to be approached, perhaps if I need someone else as an ally to get this through the committee, okay? So those are more political calculations, but they don't even make sense unless I have some ulterior uh, purpose, of course. Okay, so this is especially true then in institutional settings, in places of work and the like, where we have sometimes to take into account this rather more instrumental kind of reasoning, more political, calculative kind of reasoning. But I don't think that's the end of politics. You know, politics should be oriented to some vision of a, a better arrangement or a better, an institution, a better institution, a better city to live in. Now, of course, this need to calculate who's on the committee, how do I approach them, uh, what's the best timing for this idea I've got, that's the sort of thing that real politicians are very good at. The sad thing is that sometimes they're not very good at anything else. That's the only way they can think. I don't know how Donald Trump figures in that. I <laughs> um, the range of ethics. Now I've used the word, I used the word morality and the word ethics just now and I moved quite quickly from one to the other. But what's the difference? Now, some people think there's a very clear cut difference between morality and ethics. And I've also put by the side there values and facts. And again, some people think there's a very clear cut difference between those two. We'll come back to that in a minute. So there is a deeper sense in which ethics, that's to say questions of values, and that's what it originally means in ancient Greek, something to do with questions of value. There is a real sense in which ethics 
spread over human action more generally. Questions of value are always there. So if you take the way uh, we're behaving in this room, uh, I don't think anybody is doing anything very self-consciously, but we're all behaving in a certain way. You know, we're sitting down, you're all sitting in silence. It's the kind of behavior that's appropriate to this context, isn't it? And you're attending to what I'm saying. If you weren't doing those things, the whole practice would break down. So why are they do you doing those things? Because there's some sense, I hope, that this is worth doing. I'm not making this out as a special class. This would apply to any class you go to. And even if you go to the coffee bar and have coffee with a friend and a chat, the same thing will apply. You'll sit down in a certain way. You'll attend to one another. You'll give them the sugar to go with their coffee or whatever they want. All of those things involve value in some minimal way. Human interaction, human purposes are value laden. Even human physiology is yet value laden. Okay, you may be able to get to some forms of biology where you're just looking at cell, cell functioning or something, and you may feel values are not very evident there. But if you think of human physiology, you're thinking in terms of the body's needs. And as soon as you say need or purpose, you're in the territory of value. Okay, so we can't understand human beings at all without some notion of value. Now, value can be hidden by some uses, um, or aspects of value can be hidden. And surprisingly, one of them is there at the center of educational research. When people speak of ethics in the context of educational research, you know, on a research methods course, for example, this tends to have a very specific connotation. And it's to do with the correct procedures in conducting the research procedures regarding confidentiality, how you handle data, getting appropriate permission, your treatment of research subjects, the people who you are questioning or examining in some way. If you think of, of course, I'm not talking about philosophical or um, uh, research or historical research generally, but if you think of the kind of empirical research that most people in this building would be doing, and the kind of empirical research which is assumed to be uh, taking place in research methods courses, then it roughly has three phases to it. There's a first phase where you identify a topic. Why do boys not do better when they're taking maths classes when they're 15? Why do girls do better than boys? That might be the research topic. Then there'll be the test that you construct. So you're going to do um, a qualitative study of 15 year old boys and girls, because you need the control group, you need the comparison, right? A qualitative study of boys and girls, get the data in. And then the third phase will be when you've got the data and you're analyzing it and discussing it, comparing it with the research literature. Right, if you look at the research methods ethics course, the ones that they will give you, or research methods ethics as it comes up in the handbooks for educational research, it's all focused on that middle phase about how you interview the students or the teachers or whoever it is, whether you have permission, how you handle the data. But there's something profoundly lacking there because this hides the fact that the first phase, when you construct your research question, when you even identify a topic, already involves questions of value. Why did you choose that topic? Why does it matter what boys are doing? These are already value questions. Ethics is already there full-blown at the start. And when you've collected your data, the data doesn't really speak for itself, does it? So you're going to evaluate your data, you're going to interpret it in relation to other studies, and you're probably going to make recommendations as to what should be changed. It's possible in some subjects, perhaps in biochemistry, that the experiment is done and the data speaks for itself. But that's hardly ever the case in educational research. There's always a lot of interpretation and discussion that goes on that inevitably concerns questions of value. So I'm worried by research methods courses because it seems to me that they hide what I've just said. They make you think ethics is just a technical thing to do with codes of practice. So I want to say ethics is pervasive. It runs through everything. 
So while all this is important, this emphasis is apt to hide the massive questions of value there at the start of the research in selecting the topic and the discussion of the data and presenting findings. But what is ethics? We tend to think first of headline problems, large-scale problems, problems that make you feel you're really thinking about something very important. And they might be in real life, or they might be kind of um, exercises you do to work out the logic of a situation, like a debating exercise, or something you might write an essay on, let's say. So should I fight in the war? Should I leave my wife, my husband, my partner? Should I put money into an offshore account to avoid paying so much tax in this country? Should I have an abortion? Okay, so these are major questions, sometimes, as I said, faced by an individual in life, but sometimes they're put up for discussion in various ways, away from context. Nothing, in a sense, there's nothing wrong with that. We need to address those issues, both when we confront them in reality and we need to think about them more generally. Should capital punishment be allowed? Now that's a real question that we should all think about in some degree and one hopes one never has to deal with it directly. But surely ethics is also the stuff, part of our ordinary interactions with one another. So think of the sour, the, the nasty remark you made to your partner, your daughter, your friend, etc. at breakfast today because you were in a bad mood. Wasn't that an ethical matter? Weren't values concerned there? Think of the spontaneous word of encouragement that you might have given to a struggling colleague. Perhaps you did give that word of encouragement. And remember that we make the slightest difference in the way we phrase something or talk to somebody or even look at them and that slight difference can make a huge uh, difference to the effect it has on them. So ethics does seem to be there in these little unkindnesses and kindnesses, little acts of generosity or warmth or coldness or harshness, which our language is always going to be uh, working through. Any reactions? So all this raises questions also about what we might think of as seriousness. Let me explain this to you a little bit because, well, I'll read the rest first, especially whether some of the theorizing in textbooks or in essays and so on, or game scenarios, debates about capital punishment amongst 14 year olds are really serious or are they a distraction from the pervasiveness of ethics in our lives? Now, I'm, giving, I'm thinking of quite a specific case here. In the 1960s, um, in this country, there was a, a project to, tra to, to improve the way that um, moral education took place. And so the idea was that instead of the kind of old-fashioned Victorian way of the teacher telling the students what was right and what was wrong, instead of that, the students would be encouraged to reason for themselves over important issues. So groups of about 10 students, 14 year olds, 15 year olds, would sit round a table and the teacher would try to take the role of a, a chair person for that discussion. The teacher wouldn't be telling them what's right or wrong, they would chair the discussion. So as this was 1960s in England, one of the topics might be, should fox hunting be banned? All right, so that's quite a has been quite a sensitive topic in this country. Should fox hunting be banned? Should capital punishment be banned? The death penalty. Should abortion be allowed? This is in the 1960s. Should it be made legal? Okay, now the point I want to make to you is that these, this encouraged the students to take seriously what they were saying in, in one sense. You know, they liked doing this they liked the fact that others would listen to them expressing their views. And of course, they were encouraged to listen carefully to what others were saying as well and try to weigh up those arguments. 
But I think there was a way in which it wasn't serious, and it's as follows. That if you take just one of those examples, the capital punishment example, this was, one hopes, completely remote from the circumstances of the children's lives. So it was like a theoretical exercise. Okay, it has some value, but a theoretical exercise. If you take a more sensitive subject, take abortion, then the students would discuss this, and one, again, one hopes that they hadn't confronted the, that problem in their own experience, but it is possible, I suppose, that they would know someone who had. But can you imagine the peer pressure in that discussion? How difficult it would be to genuinely say what you thought. How careful you would be to attend to what your friends were saying, to what seemed to be an acceptable remark in this discussion. So in this sense, it loses seriousness. It's not really about morality. It's about seeing what your friends are saying. And it's about constructing some argument or some position which will sound cool or sound OK in some way. So that would be the danger of that. And those same people sitting around the table, maybe they had been horrible to their sister over breakfast that morning. You see the point then? It, it hides the pervasiveness of ethics by focusing on headline issues. Right, and this may prompt us to realize that the ethical is inherent in all practices. That's my own view, that there's nothing that is outside ethics. Ethics runs through, values run through everything. Okay. So values of some kind, some sense of better or worse, some sense of purpose perhaps, that something matters is there. Right, just before we go on then, let me try to say something more about fact and value in this respect. Again, part of the modern Western way of thinking, and by modern I mean the last 400 years, is to take the view that facts are one realm of thought and values something else. Many philosophers have said exactly this. Facts are out there, values are kind of in your head, subjective or something. So facts would include the fact that there are 25 tables in this room and uh, 18 people, um, and there's a camera switched on now. All those would be facts about the world. Whereas whether this is interesting, whether it's worth doing, uh, whether you feel happy today, all of those would be purely subjective things to do with your own values. But I want to resist that because I think the notion of a table is already a value-laden notion. For example, you know, a table is a table in virtue of its function in the lives of human be beings. Tables have value because you can lean on them or write on them or eat food off them or rest your cup off on them and so on. They're constructed for particular human purposes. So values are already there in tables. And you might also say, why did I mention tables when I described this room, the facts in this room? I didn't tell you how much nitrogen there was in the room. There's also a fact to do with that, but I didn't bother to mention that because we wouldn't normally think about that. But numbers of tables matter. We needed to make sure the right number of tables were here for the number of people. So certain facts of the room show up because of the nature of the values that inhere in them. Do you see that? And there's no limit to the number of facts you could produce about this room. Um, how many insects there are in the carpet, um, how many molecules of hydrogen or whatever. There, there's no end to these facts. But we call some to light, we highlight some because they matter. And in fact, that's, that's what science itself does. It draws attention to things that matter. It just doesn't go around counting one fact after another. Now, of course, the example I gave you of tables is, you might say, an artificial one because it's human made. So, of course, it's for human purposes. But I want to take it further. Suppose we are in the forest and we see trees. Suppose you just see a tree. Well, I don't think our relation to trees is just to a neutral fact in the world. We notice trees for certain reasons, perhaps because we can shelter under them or take food from them or make things from the wood, perhaps because we want to paint them too. And also we notice trees because they bear a certain relation to our height. You know, a tree is typically bigger than you are, but it's not so big you can, 
you, you can't get the whole thing in view. If it was a thousand times smaller, we wouldn't notice it. If it was a thousand times bigger, it wouldn't figure in the same way. So again, noticing those things relates, relates to human physiology and interests. Can I carry on? OK, so I've raised this relation between ethics and morality, those two terms. Where do we go with this? Isn't there a distinction between the two? So such distinctions are apt to be legislative. By legislative, I mean you can say by ethics I mean this, by morality I mean this. You can stipulate what you mean by the two. And once you've stipulated, you can use boxes and you can divide things between them. But I'm not sure that's very faithful to tradition, to, sorry, to experience. It looks like an attempt to tidy up experience, whereas in experience, and the nature of the world are in fact much more messy. So making a clear distinction here will not necessarily show us what matters. So I think it's worth thinking about the fact that ethics is a word of Greek origin, ancient Greek origin, and morality is a Latin one. So morality, the word, comes from Moralis, that so we're talking about 2,000 years ago. The Greek word comes from, say, 2,500 years ago, or going in that di direction. Now, modern Greek has uh, moralikos or something, doesn't it? I think. Um, actually, it's, it's the other way around because being moral in Greek is ethikos. So being moral goes back to ethics. Precisely. That's the point I'm making that the older word, the older concept, the older word is, is the word from which we get ethics. And I'm going to try and say something about this distinction. And this relates to a difference between Greek ways of life and Roman ways of life, as I'll try to show. OK, so in ancient Greece, there was a sense of ethics pervading everything as partly figured in the idea of the Greek gods. So. The Greek landscape, I mean the landscape that one lives in, the, the climate of thought and feeling one lives in, the metaphysics if you like as well, it's in a sense a bit like a Van Gogh painting, where the, in the Van Gogh painting I want to suggest electricity runs through the cornfield, through the tree, the cypress tree, through the sower of seeds and to the sky. Do you know what I mean, the way that he paints those lines running through things all the time? You'll see in a minute. Morality might make us think of the management and organization of the Roman Empire. So the Roman Empire was brilliant uh, as a colonizing force. It could organize, very bureaucratic, it could manage in a way that we've learned to copy, perhaps particularly in the British, British Empire, I'm ashamed to say. Hence, it may be better to use the terms more or less interchangeably, morality and ethics. I don't want to distinguish when I use them particularly, but I slightly prefer to talk about ethics because of its looser sense and its connections with that Greek way of thinking. So there's the cornfield. Can you see that, the, as it were, there's a vibration in the lines of the corn? And that vibration goes up through the trees and into the sky itself. And that vibration suggests a kind of energy that runs through things, which of course is exactly what happens. Hello, Marinette, come in. That's exactly what really happens. And the Greek notions of uh, physics, for example, and uh, of stuff, of substance, the words there, as it were, have a dynamism to them whereas the Latin words freeze that, fix it, hold it fast. Again, I think you might think of, uh, I'm fairly sure this works in Indian thought, um, that there's a sense of movement in things, and in a way the gods in the Hindu world are rather like the gods in the Greek world, active in the world, moving through things, not surveying things from outside, which is the way the Christian god tends to be understood. So if you think of that as something like this Greek way of thinking, and think of that as the Roman way of thinking. This is a troop of uh, centurions, 100 soldiers, 10 by 10, which is how they, that's why they're called centurions. 
and organized rigidly in set formations. Do you see what I'm trying to say then? That it's better to think of ethics or morality along the left-hand lines rather than the right-hand lines. Okay? That ethics runs through all things, like this energy that runs through all things. Do you want to say anything about that, or shall I carry on? Go on, carry on. Okay. Yeah. All right. Okay. So I, all this does interrelate because emotions relate to senses of value, and in turn to senses of right and wrong, as we, we can easily see in the case of political emotions. So what counts as a political emotion? Well, here are some candidates. And perhaps a very obvious one, if you're thinking about education, is patriotism. Now certainly in Japan, it's been a very hot topic how far the education system should encourage nationalistic feeling, patriotism by another name. It's a very sensitive thing in educational policy and practice. And I think it's fair to say that it divides uh, teachers themselves, and it certainly divides politicians. Okay, so patriotism can take various, uh, have various faces to it, perhaps pride in one's country, or maybe support for one's country, even when it's done bad things. You remain loyal to it, you try to make it better, or even when one's country is in a very grim state. And it may be a more cheery emotion, just a happy sense of belonging. All of those things could be encouraged. Schooling might encourage a kind of militaristic attitude, mightn't it, in relation to one's country. Um, some of us watched a film quite recently set in Israel where children were uh, taught very militaristic attitudes, even young children. And we have the uh, horrific example of children in the care of ISIL in Syria who are taught how to behead people, how to cut their head off. So obviously that can take terrible, grotesque forms. I'm not saying they're all, all grotesque, of course. Um, it could be another thing. It could be that um, a positive political emotion encourages, is a matter of commitment to democratic forms. You like democracy, you value this, you feel positively towards it. So there would be an emotional aspect to that. It involves a longer term commitment, it's not just a passing state. But if you never felt good about this, these democratic practices, then something would be missing. So when Nelson Mandela was released from prison, probably most of you can't remember it actually, but when he was released from prison in 1990, I think, then many, many people committed to democracy felt a kind of euphoria, re real, uh, very warm, good feeling about that. If you didn't feel that, there would be something odd about your attitudes to democracy. So the emotional is already there. And now a more negative emotion, which I think that's the word I used earlier on, isn't it? Resentment, feeling that something unjust or bad has been done to you or to people you care about. And it's that response to injustice, which surely many people in the world, in all countries feel, and with good reason. And of course, that can become stronger to become a sort of anger, and of course can fuel rebellion, rebellion, revolution, terrorism indeed. So there's quite a range of what these emotions can be like. It's not the kind of pleasant emotions we might connect with maybe number one or two, patriotism and commitment to democracy. So political emotions clearly can have positive and negative forms. And just before we go there, one of the worries I think is that citizenship education tends almost always to put the emphasis on the positive forms whether it's nationalistic and patriotic, or whether it's more to do with living happily with other people, toleration, kindness to others, valuing community. It nearly always puts the emphasis on the positive and neglects the negative aspects. 
Well, I said we would come back to what politics is, and this uh, will fill in a little bit more of this. So earlier I made some cynical remarks about the way politicians are good at reading the politics of the situation, knowing how to work this committee or to influence that person who to involve. They're sometimes very good at that, but they lose the broader point of politics, which is something to do with achieving a just society, an appropriate or just good way to live together, putting it broadly. Now in the Greek, this was figured particularly with the word for city or city-state, the polis, and that's where the word politics comes from, as most of you will know, I'm sure. But politics then, deriving from this Greek word, means something like city or city-state, and in a sense, this represents something broader. How do we create the city? It doesn't mean where do we lay the first stone or which building should we have here. It means what will constitute a just city. And in a sense, this is what the Athenians were wrestling with, and this is what Plato records in his dialogue. This is the question they came, kept coming back to. Because there was no sense that you could live a good life in isolation. To have a meaningful life, you must be with others in some degree. And even if you cho to choose to live in a library or in relative isolation, you're still in a sense involved with others precisely because you're reading books or thinking and writing. In other words, you're drawing from that shared culture that's produced you and which you are contributing to in some sense. So it's a matter of how we must live together, which is part of that other question, how should we live? It's the most fundamental question that in some sense all human beings face. So the city then, in these terms, the polis, is a kind of project. So it's not, we don't have democracy because we vote every four years or whatever it is. Democracy is something we don't have, but it's something we're constantly reaching towards. Do you see that? The city is yet to come. Democracy is yet to come. It's something we're still reaching towards. Of course, we have it in some respects, but clearly we don't. We shouldn't be complacent. We shouldn't just relax. Do you get me or not? Do you understand? Yeah, yeah okay, okay. Okay, so the city is a project, something we're going forward towards. It's a project of finding the right way to live together. And this will be an ongoing project because it's a fantasy to think that in 20, 2025, we'll have it all sorted out. We know exactly how to do it. We'll have all the rules in place. Then we'll have the just society. That's not going to happen. That's a, a, a naive kind of perfectibility that's imagined there. We won't be at that position. We'll be struggling with this um, as an ongoing thing. And let's hope we can improve, of course. And in the end, Socrates said, our city is a city of words. Why would he say that? It's all just words? Well, the point is that it's out of words that we have all this stuff around us. We wouldn't have these buildings if there weren't the words that made physics and engineering and concrete chemistry. All of those things are needed for us to have what we've got here. We wouldn't have universities unless there weren't, were, wasn't a development of thought, a valuing of ways in which we can extend education together. Okay, so words are actually at the heart of our reasoning our lives as human beings. And if you remember what we said earlier on about the unkind remark at breakfast, the way these words are and the kind of city we shape is not just to do with engineering projects, it's also part of the words we're, we're exchanging with one another now and what you were saying before I came into the room this morning or when you were traveling here with your friend this morning. All the time you're saying words to another, one another which contribute in some tiny way to what the world is. Your words, are, your words are acts which extend the world even in some minimal way. They develop a relationship or they frustrate one. They extend your own thinking or they, they stop it off in some way. Can you see the, the resonance of that thought then, that words are at the heart of everything? So in the Greek word logos, which is also means reason, of course, it's something between language and reason, there's also the sense of a way as well. And it intrigues me that um, Jesus uh, 
not, not in the Bible, at the beginning of the Gospel of St. John, the words are, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. So everything comes out of words. It's an extraordinary thought. Not in the beginning was the sun or in the, something like that. In the beginning was the word. When that's tra translated into um, Japanese, the Chinese character for Tao, for way, is used, I believe. Okay, so logos, the original Greek, becomes way in the Japanese. Okay, so it's very close to the Buddhist thought, the way, the way of life. So our words are leading away, they're opening away for us. Okay. So citizenship education, when are we going to get around to this, you might be thinking, but I think it's all important what we've been saying. I've just said a little bit about it in relation to patriotism and democratic principles and so on. Let's just go back to it in a bit more detail. In what, in what we might think of as a classic liberal version of of citizenship education, it's typically emphasized the more positive forms, encouraging, say, a disposition to look sympathetically on others, to attend to their point of view, or to care about their well-being, etc. Some of you will have heard of the Crick Report in this country, a report chaired by a committee, uh, run by a committee, produced by a committee, chaired by a man called Bernard Crick, who was a very good political philosopher, and this Crick report fed into the development of citizenship education as a part of the curriculum in the last 15 years in this country. I mention it because it's actually been very influential, this report, and it's been emulated in many countries in the world. But it's a report that is very much like John Rawls' conception of politics. It's like it in the sense that it sort of imagines a blank paper as a starting point. And it says, right, we're all human beings living together. What do we need to do? We need to know about voting systems, the institutions of government, certain facts we need to know, and we need to know our rights and responsibilities. We need to be able to work out our own point of view so that we can express a view in an election and express it to other people in discussion. We need to be able to understand the views of others and to be able to repeat those views, even though we don't agree with them, so that we can then argue with them. So skills of reasoning are very central here. And we need certain dispositions, in other words, an inclination to listen to what other people say and to attend sympathetically to what they're saying, even so that we can judge it fairly. So can you see the, abstract of the abstractness of this then? knowing the rules, having certain skills, and having certain dispositions. There's no reference there to the unfairness of society or to the fact that all societies begin somewhere in bloodshed, in the loss of blood, in fighting, in violence. Can you see that? And if you live here, it's easy not to notice that. And if you live in Japan, maybe that's true up to a point. But in many countries, that's not the case. And of course, in some parts of the United Kingdom, that perception is not quite the same. So my point is that the abstractness of this approach is like the abstractness of John Rawls. In circumstances of conflict, past or current or change, it can add further kinds of emphasis. So if we go to certain contexts, then South Africa in the era after apartheid, then, of course, there is another factor that must feed into this, which will be nation building. We've still got this place, this country called South Africa, but it's so radically different from what it was in terms of distribution of power and opportunity. And with its background of violence, physical and psychological, how do you create a new society there? It must be a new project, not just a continuation. And you can think of many other examples where that would apply. Think of post-war Syria, if there will be such a thing. How on earth will that be put together again? In other contexts, what I've just been saying about Bernard Crick would need to be supplemented by toleration of difference and ways you don't, of life you don't approve of. 
So within the UK, in Northern Ireland, with the very divided society between a Catholic population and a Protestant population with different historical allegiances, then you don't want to emphasize nationalism or patriotism because people don't share a common sense of that. But what you must emphasize is the importance of toleration so that people don't kill each other. Being prepared to live with people whose ways of life you don't like. And of course, there can be a more overt and national emphasis in, uh, on patriotism, as we've said. What's striking, however, is the neglect of political negative emotions, in spite of the fact that such emotions characterize the experience of so many people around the world. Hence, there tends to be something, I would say, bourgeois about the way that citizenship and political education are conceived. Does that make sense? Do you see why it's bourgeois? Because it rather complacently assumes a blank piece of paper, a blank canvas before you start. Because it tends to put the emphasis on positive feelings. Yes, we must all care for one another. Yes, we must all support our country. Those things. It denies the, the torment, the trouble in the past, the existing injustice. So, of course, it's easy to take pictures off the net that can shock us into thinking of somewhere different. So that's Syria today. And that's Bosnia in former Yugoslavia in the 1990s. It's very easy to do this. It's almost, um, I hesitate to do it in a way because it's, it can be voyeuristic in this circumstance just to do this. Extraordinary poverty. Rich living next to poor, favelas, I presume, next to uh, affluence on the other side of the river. Terrible poverty in Africa. And then I said I was going Christmas shopping, so that one too. So it does come home too. And at another level, of course, think of the immense political emotion there is in some of the campaigns, these uh, popular uh, uprisings or movements or protest movements that exist, stopping child labor, stopping female genital mutilation. And this is a protest movement in Les Landes in the south of France against the destroying of this for commercial purposes, destroying of this landscape. Those people are occupying that land just as people occupy Wall Street. In, symbolically occupy Wall Street. And again, very topical here, on a different scale, of course, the protests against the third runway at Heathrow because of its destruction of local environments in certain ways. Okay. That's where I wanted to take us towards then, this focus on more negative political emotions, because I think just to concentrate on those positive political emotions becomes bourgeois complacent, too tidy, too easy, too easy to turn into a, a neat curriculum.